Leaders Conversations with Leaders for Aspiring Leaders. I am Brian Lass, and the Smash True Crimes Netflix series, The Night Stalker, The Hunt for a Serial Killer. You know, certainly for the average layperson, this perhaps a perceived action thriller. But of course, for my uh, guest today, he knows all too well that this was uh, certainly fact, not fiction, being that his role in the investigation of the Night Stalker unequivocally lent to Richard Ramirez being uh, captured and brought to justice. As such, joining me today, I'm all too absolutely privileged and humbled to welcome. He is retired Detective Lieutenant of the Los Angeles County Sheriff Department, Gil Carrillo. And Detective, again, absolute pro- uh, pleasure and privilege to have you here today. Well, thank you. It's my honor. I'm glad. Uh, I'm just flattered that you asked, and I'm willing to answer any questions you have and see if we can help future leaders uh, along in the program. Excellent, and, and certainly a great uh, preamble right there to set the landscape. And I, I will say to that effect, and maybe in the interest of, of interjecting some humor right off the bat here, I know our chat today, which admittedly I was, I was, you can ask my wife, very excited about and certainly long on the making here. But, uh, you know, certainly when you and I had our intro discussions, I remember you, you actually presented some concerns. You know, I, am I going to be of the applicable sort of stature for the channel? And, and I'll be honest, and I haven't told you this yet, I mentioned to my wife, I'm like, does this guy not know who he is? He's Gil Carrillo. He's a friggin' living legend. How could he be asking me this? So, so nevertheless, and certainly the point I'm trying to arrive at, I mean, it certainly speaks uh, true and indicative of, of the fact that you're, you're you're definitely one of the most humble, nicest individuals I've had the pleasure to to get to sit down with. So again, I, I certainly can't thank you enough for graciously lending your time here today. Thank you. <laughs> Excellent. So, you know, certainly one of the things I'm, I'm curious about, and maybe to get the conversation going here, uh, I mean, obviously, the, the whole Night Stalker investigation sort of, uh, you know, stemming from the mid 1980s, uh, you know, arguably a better time, certainly pre COVID anyways. Uh, but, you know, we fast forward 36 years, here we are in, in the year 2021. And this being the year that certainly gave birth to the smash Netflix series. So I, I'm certainly curious, you know, how this resurgence came about that that brought to light, uh, you know, what we know as the Night Stalker Netflix series. Well, it actually uh, was brought about by a friend, uh, an acquaintance of mine uh, a couple of years ago, who's in the television writing business. He worked uh, on, he, at that time he was working on the program Chicago PD. He was a writer and he's a longtime family friend. I knew his, his uncle and his grandparents uh, for years. He approached me and said, you know, if you look at uh, today's television programming, you don't see many Hispanics in the possible in a in a possible role in, in a uh, positive role. They're always being arrested. They're going to jail. They're shooting people, selling drugs. And he said, it's, I'm really thinking about isn't it time that we show a Hispanic in a positive manner? And he threw out the idea. Of course, I laughed at him and. You know, thinking to myself, well, I hope you find somebody worthy of it. And that that just started. It went from one mouth, one idea to another, and eventually ended up in the hands of Mr. Tiller Russell, who's a brilliant uh, director. Nothing. I don't know anything about the cinema business. Uh, I just know that when they tell me I'm meeting the director, I'm expecting to see some gray haired old eyeglass wearing man that's <laughs> old been doing this for years and he's a very young man very just a lot of fun to be around he was a good guy and he said he wanted to try something and i agreed to go along with him. that's how it started and uh, this came about Excellent. C- certainly the rest is history and we're all, we're all better people. Certainly as uh, in the law enforcement community, I can tell you for certain for, for having seen it. Uh, now, you know, as, as I understand it, correct me if I'm wrong, I, I guess it was uh, going back in time here, 1971, that uh, sort of gave birth to your policing career. I, be- I believe it was 1971. You first found yourself in uniform as a new patrol officer. And, and certainly we know the succession of events from there, but maybe for, for some, some of you know the people watching who may not necessarily have seen the, the Netflix series as of yet, or be too sort of anti equated with Gil Carrillo. Maybe you can give us a, a, a brief sort of rundown of the major succession of events that finds you, even perhaps to where you are present day. And, you know, certainly we're, we're very curious what you're up to nowadays. Well, it actually started out when I was a young teenager running the streets like I shouldn't have been. And there was a young deputy sheriff that used to come around and check on us. What I now understand was great police work, uh, what I didn't know then. And uh, I was not doing well in school and I was not going to pass. I would have been the first one of uh, seven siblings that didn't graduate. And I just said, uh, my English teacher said, if you write a term paper, I'll give you a D, which will allow you to pass. And I asked him if uh, he would help me. I wanted to write a a paper on policemen. He helped me. It got me my D. 
He took me home, told my parents, signed for him to get off the streets or he'll end up dead or in prison. So at the age of 17, my parents signed for me to go into the army. I went into the army. Two months after my 18th birthday, I ended up in a place called Vietnam. And after one year of combat, three years of military life, I had matured and I realized there was, I had a better appreciation on life. And I knew what I wanted out of life. And at that time I decided I wanted to go to college, uh, which is nothing that nobody in my family had ever tried to do or wanted to do. And uh, I wanted to become a cop. I wanted to give back what that cop gave to me and maybe save somebody else because he certainly saved my life. And uh, that was it. I had the, the third goal I had in life, which wasn't too kind. I wanted to start dating my former girlfriend who had written me a Dear John when I was in the Army, when I was in Vietnam. <laughs> I wanted to start dating her, getting her out of the palm of my hands, and then revenge would be mine because I wanted to break up with her and watch her suffer <laughs> like I had. I got out in June of 1970. Uh, September 70, I had her eaten out of the palm of my hand the day after Christmas. 1970, we got married. And we just celebrated our 50th anniversary. So I guess two out of three of my goals were successful. And I'm glad that they're <laughs> Absolutely. I, well, congrats on the 50th for certain. <laughs> I then got on the sheriff's department, ended up out in patrol. While out in patrol, uh, they asked me to start working their gang unit because I could relate to the gang members. Started the first plain clothes gang unit out there. Uh, gangs was my stepping stone. Uh, March 23rd, 1981, I was transferred to Homicide Bureau because they had uh, a gang homicide unit beginning up there. And the rest was history. Then I just started working murders, which was my goal. In our department, at least, uh, we have one central homicide bureau, and it's creme de la creme. I was the youngest guy to get there in years. I was probably for the first seven years of my term there, I was the youngest guy in the bureau. Fantastic. Yeah, and, and certainly, again, this is all, all, all bringing back uh, certainly memories of when I was, you know, basically reliving your career with you, certainly watching the Netflix series and, uh, you know, something to be said absolutely to everything you just, uh, you know, mentioned that you achieved. And, uh, you know, even sort of, I guess, latching on now, you know, you talking about arriving in ham homicide as, a, you know, a young officer, things of that nature. And I know at, at that time, that's where you were first sort of connected with Frank Salerno, who I know obviously was was very much of a uh, somewhat of a mentor or maybe leadership figure for you. And I would imagine many other detectives as well, uh, sort of sort of new in the game. And, uh, you know, with that being said as well, you know, inevitably you got into uh, to that of detective lieutenant. And I know the latter part of your career, I think it was about 13 homicide detectives, I believe you had responsible charge of. I may have got the numbers 13 wrong. 13 homicide investigators are working for me. Absolutely. So so you certainly saw it from both angles. I mean, you yourself, obviously, uh, you know, certainly arriving at this perceivable leadership role, being under the tutelage of other leaders. So, you know, to preface an earlier sentiment to hopefully shape, uh, you know, a new generation of leaders watching, I, I guess as a starting sentiment, I'm quite curious, you know, what, what does leadership really mean to Gil Carrillo? It really means uh, having the ability to guide individuals. And when I had 14 investigators working for me, I had four, like 14 children. Everybody has their own personality. And your job as a leader is to mold them together and extract the best from each one of them, get them to work together in harmony. And there's nothing more you can do uh, other than that. You want to get people, uh, it is always best to have people that want to work for you as opposed to people that you have to make work for you. You have to set the tone, you have to be their leader and all work together. You're just like the father figure of a family or if you're a female, you're the mother figure. You have to lead them. No, I, I, absolutely. And, uh, you know, certainly, I guess it goes along with the notion of as, as a leader, you have to have followers, perhaps without followers, you're not a leader. But obviously, there's going to be, you know, try to choose skill sets, things to, to put in the work, some of which, you know, perhaps we'll start to peel back the, the layers on during our, our chat today. Uh, now, again, to sort of go back in time, and, uh, you know, as I understand it, I, I would imagine the, you know, certainly the nice soccer investigation, perhaps the, uh, you know, the first of the major investigations, uh, again, as I understand it, you know, you arriving at, uh, you know, the, the Homicide Bureau, uh, and, and there certainly is a sentiment, you know, the, the sign of a true leader, or maybe one of the signs of a true leader is how they can navigate the landscape of a crisis. And I would certainly imagine, you know, to say that, uh, you know, a serial killer on the loose and un unprecedented serial killer on the loose is, you know, to call that a crisis is, is maybe one, one of the biggest understatements I heard of. So I'm, I'm kind of curious, you know, what lessons maybe you learn or, 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 you know, have brought with you to perhaps 
you know, allow you to be able to share that you may have learned, again, from this leadership lens, uh, all to do, you know, with, with, with regards to this Night Stalker investigation. Actually, my leadership and learning that started when I was back in Vietnam, and I learned early on, if you panic, you lose. Somebody gets hurt. Whether it's equipment, whether it's life, somebody will lose when you panic. So you have to remain a stable force. You have to remain calm in the eyes of the fire. So therefore, uh, no matter what the crisis is or what the emergency is, there's always a calm way to look at things and navigate the troubled road that you're about to take upon and lead those people behind you uh, along with you because as a leader what you're actually doing is training your subordinates to become the leader absolutely so so to that effect and and, and maybe again to to preface plausibly your time at nom and, and certainly one of the questions i have you know when you do look back at, at your career your, your working days so to speak obviously you rise through successive roles and ranks uh, you know, it sounds to me like maybe, you know, the distinct moment that you realized perhaps that there was this, you know, I, I, skill set or entity called leadership uh, and the fact that it plausibly was a skill unto itself. Would it be fair to say that maybe this came out of your time at NOM? Was there any sort of distinct time that maybe you, you, you sort of latched on to the idea of leadership and what it meant to be? Or Oh, most assuredly. I, I matured over there. I learned uh, what success could become and how our leaders got the most out of us by encouraging us, supporting us, and uh, letting us do what we had to do. If you allow your people to do what they have to do, it'll get done. And you just set the tone for it. Absolutely. And, uh, you know, to, to take it one step further, and I, I know you sort of already uh, somewhat uh, prefaced or, or mentioned this, you know, the idea perhaps, uh, you know, certainly leadership being about mentoring, and, and there certainly is a sentiment that leadership is, is plausibly about creating other leaders. I'm kind of wondering, and again, maybe when you're, you know, new in the Homicide Bureau and you're working with Frank Salerno, or or maybe even when you, you know, inevitably ventured off as a detective lieutenant, uh, you know, taking care of your homicide investigators, uh, you know, I'm, I'm kind of curious if, uh, you know, do you truly feel that leadership is solely about creating other leaders? Do you feel there's some kind of threshold or something we, be, we should be cognizant about how far ahead of the herd we may want to want to let someone run? Or what, what's sort of your take on that? Well, you, you, you always have to find someone. There's another individual in your within your team. Uh, find that someone and, and start grooming them. Allow them to take more of the role. Allow them to make decisions. And you're not, uh, not so much giving orders, but giving them information to let their minds work. You are not the only individual that knows what's going on. When I took over as leader of the 14 individuals, I had 21 years homicide investigative duties under my belt more so than anyone close in my team. But I instructed them and they I know they were concerned. Uh, we had a meeting, I said, you're gonna be, you're apprehensive, you think I'm gonna be a micromanager. And as a leader, I couldn't be. And I told them that, I'm not gonna be a micromanager. I won't even give you my opinion unless you ask for it. <laughs> that's what you do, you let them do the work. And then sometimes, sometimes they mess up, they make a mistake and just like a good father, they have to be disciplined or they have to sit there and talk to them in private, never in front of anybody. No, of course. And, and it's interesting. You, you mentioned the idea of, of, of micromanagement and, you know, certainly uh, th there's this idea and I can tell you a lot of the sort of leadership gurus that I lead to, they talk about the idea as, as a frontline worker. So certainly in the world of policing as a frontline officer, I mean, really your, your job is to be a great frontline officer and we'll give you all kinds of training, de-escalative skills, use of force, Certainly the list goes on and then, you know, plausibly you put a, a set of chevrons on your shoulder and uh, you probably got that job because you were great in the front lines. But now there's that distinction that your job isn't just to tell someone else how to do it based on how you did it. But, you know, so certainly, uh, you know, there's this whole other lens of leadership and, and all the all the exact points that you made mention. Uh, and I, that admittedly I sort of uh, transitions well into my next question. So I, I congratulate you for that. Certainly it makes my life a lot easier here. So <laughs> but uh, with that being said, um, you you know, uh, I, I guess what I'm trying to arrive at here is, you know, there is a sentiment that the, the way of the autocratic leader or, again, this sort of micromanagement telling people how, how to do it hopefully has gone by way of the cuckoo's nest. 
But I, I'm wondering if maybe there are any distinct experiences that, that perhaps you can recall, which you to- took note of exactly this, leaders who are merely managing people or, or maybe taking more of this autocratic style. And, uh, you know, as such, do you feel that there's anything that maybe these people or, or anyone watching this could put into play to hopefully flip on a dime and really embrace this idea of leadership? I don't believe there's that much room for autocratic leaders uh, because <laughs> then what good are subordinates? You're not allowing them to do anything. They don't. And that reverses the effect where you're trying to get people to want to work for you. If you have somebody telling you what to do all the time, you're not doing your work. You're doing the leader's work. And that's not what any subordinate wants to do. They want to be create their own personality and their own works, workloads. Now, now, did you have any times perhaps in your career where, which maybe you were under sort of the, the supervisory or tutelage again, I don't want you to call it <laughs> out, but may, maybe any experiences that you had personally where you felt, you know what, my, my supervisory is not necessarily, uh, you know, creating an environment conducive to morale and, and growth, but rather just sort of embracing this autocratic style. Is there any time where, where maybe you had a distinct moment of that or? You know, for the most part, uh, especially since I spent most of my career working murders, uh, they don't want to interfere with the investigators, those that don't know what they're doing, because they're afraid if they make a mistake, it'll cost the investigation and the blame would be on them. Uh, however, it, does, it still does happen. And I can tell you right now, during this Night Stalker case, uh, certain executives interfered and interjected with our investigation and decided to call a shot. And when they did, uh, it came back and bit them. It was the wrong decision. Uh, we were totally against it. They did it. And it cost us. So they once again went back to, okay, do what you got to do. I got you. And, and it's and it's interesting that you you sort of talk about the idea of working amongst, you know, homicide investigators or, or rather this environment of investigating murders. And I believe it was Frank Salander who, who described it as that, you know, it's the most, you know, heinous or egregious thing that any officer or, or investigator could, uh, you know, could, could really endeavor to, to work on the idea of someone taking someone else's life. And uh, that, that certainly, and admittedly, in, in regards to this next sort of question, puts an interesting spin on things, because uh, as I said in many of my previous, you know, sort of uh, YouTube episodes here, us as humans, we're social creatures, we obviously respond and react to the to the environment uh, that we work within. But, you know, that being said, you know, it, it almost seems like it, it would be a little bit of a balancing act because, you know, we have investigators who are obviously dealing in the world of a homicide bureau with some very, very egregious, you know, finite things. But at the same time, as a leader, there's this idea perhaps of wanting to create a, an environment that's conducive to, you know, let's say good morale, motivation, growth, obviously the employees wanting to come to work, things of this nature. So I'm wondering what experiences you've had with sort of this balancing act. Again, the idea of, of wanting to be this leader, this mentor, creating a great environment, but I guess being, uh, you know, cer- certainly uh, switched on to the idea of, you know, we're obviously dealing with some with some some nasty stuff here, so to speak. <laughs> Well, it is, and it's it's all a matter of, uh, I, it, down to its basic, it's treating people the way you'd like to be treated. And nobody likes to be ridiculed. Nobody wants to be found making mistakes. You allow them to go, and then at times you hint. You don't order. You hint that maybe there's another way to do things, and because there's always more than one way to skin a cat. And <laughs> just because you did it one way doesn't make it the right way. So you just, it's a team, it's a team role. Gotcha. Now, now, maybe not even necessarily speaking to the to policing world. I mean, I know certainly that that's your background, but, uh, you know, it may very well have been the case. You've taken note with other industries. Would you see overall, I mean, we're doing a, a good job of, of training leaders to lead, you know, as we grow in successive ranks and maybe speaking specific to the policing world. I'm not certain if there's anything you took note of, of, you know, maybe as someone, you know, ha- has more sort of, I guess, rungs in the ladder below them, they have to be cognizant of. Do you think we're, we're doing a good job of equipping everyone with the applicable skills? Is it something that maybe has gotten better with time? I, I don't know if you've had some uh, experience with that. I, I think we're, we're giving them the tools to work. It's up to the individuals. It's up to the subordinates to want to reach out and and uh, take those tools. But I think they're given the training. I think they're given the tools to work with. And, you know, as long as you don't, there's always leaders that are doing nothing more than want to be leaders. And they're using everything they do as a stepping stone. And there's a, instead of we, there's a lot of, I did this. And so they want to, uh, those are the guys that are climbing the, the ladder, you know, the proverbial <laughs> ladder to get on up there to the top. And once they get up to the top, they normally just kind of fade away, hopefully, and let you do your job. (laughs) 
I got you. Well, I'll tell you what, you know, Detective, you've been absolutely so, uh, you know, kind and gracious with your time here today. And and uh, I have I, I sort of usually finish up with the maybe infamous, you know, provide some advice, insight type of question. And I know for you, you've probably been approached about 8 billion times by now with people asking for advice and insight in their careers and things of that nature. So so maybe I'll, I'll try to preface this in, in, in a little bit of a different manner here. And I will tell you, uh, absolutely, one of my favorite moments in the in the uh, in the Netflix series was in episode one where you were talking about, uh, be, I believe, it was being invited to Little Joe's with Frank and the gang, and I think yes. it was ch- ch- chicken parmesan you ended up having, and, and you know, right. just sort of sort of started laughing and thinking, you know, life doesn't get better than this or something to that effect. And I, I could only certainly wish for everyone in their personal and, and, and career endeavors to have that pinnacle, you know, chicken parmesan moment, if I can refer to it that way. In that, you know, I, I feel I've arrived, I've gotten to where I want to be. So. So maybe in prefacing the question this way, and maybe, it, it, you know, sort of uh, offering any advice or insight for those who are looking to have that sort of pinnacle moment, uh, you know, whether it's, uh, you know, people who aspire to be leaders or maybe people who are just trying to, to grow in their in their personal professional endeavors, uh, you know, p- perhaps any insight or advice you found to a uh, way very, very favorable for you as you've, uh, you know, climbed the ranks in your career. Well, I, I think you just have to set your goals. And if you have desire, you can achieve anything you want to in life. You have to have the understanding that there's a different side to every coin. And you have to have the most important ability, and that's to listen. Listen to the question. Listen to what people are saying as opposed to thinking of your response or thinking of your next question. Uh, Treat people the way you'd like to be treated, and absolutely the most important, never forget where you came from. Because when you lose sight of where you once started, you've lost that ability to communicate all the way down through the from the bottom to the top. Absolutely. Very insightful. And again, I thank you ever so very kindly for being here. And, and certainly I'm, I'm wishing all the way from Toronto to sunny California, much health and vigilance to you and yours as we obviously navigate this uh, tumultuous uh, pandemic landscape. But again, uh, you know, so so very, uh, you know, humbling and, and definitely uh, very appreciative of your time here today. And uh, certainly for all of you watching as well, of course, we always appreciate you tuning in. Again, a special thanks to my guest, uh, Detective Lieutenant Retired Gil Carrillo of the Los Angeles County Sheriff's Department. If you have not yet uh, seen, of course, the uh, true crime series, uh, The Night Stalker on Netflix, obviously, uh, if maybe you've been living out of rock, make sure you go tune into Netflix and watch it. <laughs> but nevertheless, we thank you for your time, and we'll see you all the next time. Take care. Thank you.